the Glore Psychiatric Museum in St. Joseph, Missouri, showed a comprehensive history of psychiatric care surrounding specifically the history of St. Joseph State Lunatic Asylum No. 2. The asylum began in 1874 and was first viewed as a sanctuary and temporary housing for mentally ill patients. Throughout history and stagnant process of mental health treatments, these patients became more permanent than expected. Particularly throughout the Depression and the World Wars, state and federal funds were so depleted that these institutions became low on the totem pole. Numbers in these institutions also significantly increased with soldiers returning home with shell shock, now known as PTSD. The mentally ill were basically ignored. In fact, the stigma of mental health was so strong that families would basically desert their loved ones at the asylum. When the patients passed at the asylum, their graves were numbered as families did not want their last name to be present in a psychiatric asylum cemetery. One treatment modality I found to be particularly interesting is the history of lobotomies. In the early 1800s, Franz Gall kickstarted the idea that emotions are housed in different locations of the brain. This study was called phrenology and was somewhat unfounded in its time. This was true until a man named Phineas Gage. Phineas worked as a railroad laborer placing tracks when suddenly a piece of dynamite exploded, thrusting an iron rod through his frontal lobe. Phineas left miraculously alive from the incident. Strangely enough, a man who was once incredibly responsible and kind now was aggressive and could not hold a job. This sparked an idea that emotions and personality are truly housed in the frontal lobe of the brain. Then it was hypothesized, if a man can be turned aggressive, why can't a depressed or schizophrenic patient have their personality changed as well? Thus, the lobotomy was born. Dr. Walter Freeman's method has proved the most famous and also seen as the most reckless. Freeman coined the ice pick lobotomy that could be performed without anesthesia and immediately was adopted due to the lack of funding. Freeman traveled around the country performing the procedures. Risk for infection was extremely high as Freeman performed these procedures without a mask or gloves. Though a very small percentage had the wanted effect of personality reversal, the majority of patients either died from the procedure or became mentally handicapped and dependent. Towards the end of the 1960s, the stigma of the lobotomy had caught up and the procedure was deserted. Though now we find this practice to be inhumane, with no cure for these mentally ill patients, any method was worth a try. These doctors were trying their best to heal what they couldn't heal. These lobotomies were the only change for some patients to see in life outside of solitary confinement. I would like to contrast lobotomies with today's practice of pharmacological intervention. Now that we have discovered mental illness is truly a biological and pathophysiological disorder, we can understand that manipulating the chemicals such as the neurotransmitters and the balance in the body that can help alleviate these neurological symptoms. Beginning with the discovery of Thorazine in 1951, the transition began to pharmacological intervention. Its action works to alter dopamine in the central nervous system. It also has anticholinergic effects. Thorazine is the first drug developed specifically as an antipsychotic, but it was soon seen, just as Parkinson's is caused from a lack of dopamine, soon patients taking this medication long term were suffering from tardive dyskinesia, characterized by involuntary and repetitive movements. This side effect and many others showed the downfall of the medication, that other disorders can develop from the long-term usage of a medication. Since Thorazine's development, many other drug classes manipulating the central nervous system to treat mental disorders have erupted, such as benzodiazepines, SSRIs, and atypical antipsychotics. One downfall of pharmacological intervention is that the disorder is never cured, only controlled. These medications must be taken at the correct dosage and time, or the signs and symptoms will reappear. Many patients will either feel better or not themselves and stop taking the medication, spurring an episode of psychosis or depression. Though these downfalls can be detrimental, medications have allowed these patients with psychological disorders to live amongst others in the community and live a life outside of the mental institution. Mental hospitals today are used primarily for patients that are either a threat to themselves or others. This history of the mental hospital system has taught us many things about the disorders, about the treatments, and the improvements that we can keep growing every day.